Today, I speak to you on the subject of individual citizenship, the one subject of vital importance to you, my audience, and to me, my countrymen, because you and we are great citizens of a great democratic republic. A democratic republic such as ours, an effort to realize its full sense of government by, of, and for the people, represents the most gigantic of all possible social experiments, the one fraught with great responsibilities, alike for good and evil. Under other forms of government, under the rule of one man, or very few, the quality of the leaders is all important. If such governments, the quality of the rulers is high enough, then the nations for generations lead a brilliant career and add substantially to the sum of the world, no matter how low the quality of the average citizen, because the average citizen is almost negligible quantity in working out the final results of that type of national greatness. But with you and us, the case is different. With you here and with us in our own home, in the long run, success or failure will be conditioned upon the way in which the average man, the average woman, does his or her duty. For in the ordinary everyday life and the next, those great occasional cries for which call the heroic virtues, the average citizen must be a good citizen if our republics are to, to succeed. The stream will not permanently rise higher than the main source, and the main source of national power and national greatness is found in the national, average citizen of that nation. Therefore, it behooves us to do our best to see that the standard of the average citizen is kept high, and the average cannot be kept high unless the standard of the leaders is very much higher. There is no more unhealthy being, no man worthy of, less worthy of respect than he who either really holds or feigns to hold an attitude of sneering disbelief toward all that is great and lofty, whether an achievement or in that noble effort which, even if it fails, comes to a second achievement, a cynical habit of thought and speech and readiness to criticize work which the critic himself never tries to perform, an intellectual aloofness which will not accept contact with life's realities. All these are marks, not as a possessor would feign to think of superiority, but of weakness. They mark the man unfit to bear their, pain, their part painfully in the stern strife of living, who seek in the affection of contempt for the achievement of others to hide from others and from themselves in their own weakness. The role is easy. There is none easier, save only for the role of the man who sneers alike at both criticisms and performance. It is not the critic who counts. Not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred with dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and, and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do deeds who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with, the, with those cold and timid souls who, need, who know neither victory nor defeat. Shame on the man of cultivated taste who permits refinement to develop into fastidiousness that unfits him for doing the rough work of a workaday world. Among the free peoples who govern themselves, there is but a small field of usefulness open for the men of cloistered life who shrink from contact with their fellows. Still less room is there for those who deride of slight what is done by those who actually bear the brunt of the day nor yet for those others who always profess that they would like to take action if only the conditions were not exactly what they are actually are. 
The man who does nothing cuts the same sordid figure of in the page, pages of history, whether he be cynic or fop or voluptuary. There is little use for the being whose tepid soul knows nothing of great and generous emotion of the high pride, the stern belief, the lofty enthusiasm of the men who quell the storm and ride the thunder. Well, for these men, if they succeed, well, also not so well if they fail, given only that they have nobly ventured and put forth all their heart and strength, it is a war-torn hot spurs spent with hard fighting, he of many errors and valiant end, whose memory we love to linger, not over the memory of the young lord, who, but for vile guns, would have been a valiant soldier. Such ordinary everyday qualities include the will and the power to work, to fight at need, and to have plenty of healthy children. The need that the average man shall work is so obvious as a hardly warrant insistence. There are very few people in every country so born that they can lead lives of leisure. These fill a useful function if they, if they make it evident that leisure work does not mean idleness. For some, most valuable work needed by civilization is essentially pawn remunerative in its character. And of those, and of course, the people who do this work should in large be drawn from those who remuneration is an objective, objective of indifference. But the average man must earn his livelihood. He should be trained to do so, and he should be trained to feel that he occupies a, contem a contemptible position if he does not do so, that he is not an object of envy if he is idle at whichever end of the social scale he stands, but an object of contempt, an object of derision. derision. In the next place, a good man should be both a strong and brave man. That is, he should be able to fight. He should be able to serve his country as a soldier, if the need arises. There are well-meaning philosophers who, decla who declaim against the unrighteousness of war. They are right only if they lay all their emphasis upon the unrighteousness. War is a dreadful thing. An unjust war is a crime against humanity. But it is such a crime because it is unjust, not because it is a war. The choice must ever be in favor of righteousness, and this is whether the alternative be peace or whether the alternative be war. The question must not be merely, is there to be peace or is there to be war? The question must be, is it right to prevail? Are the great laws of righteousness once more to be fulfilled? And the answer from a strong man and viral people must be yes, whatever the cost. Every honorable effort should always be made to avoid war, just as every honorable effort should always be by the individual in private life to keep out of a brawl, to keep out of trouble. But no self-respecting individual, no self-respecting nation can or ought to submit to wrong.